Hello and welcome to Moments with the Master. Um, this is going to be shown this Saturday, which is going to be Holy Saturday. I have uh, recently I was I was thinking about this and I realized that this uh, this channel has been on YouTube for a year now because the first video that I did was um, for Spy Wednesday. And then the second one I did was for uh, Holy Saturday. So today I'm actually recording on Monday. Um, so yeah, um, that's ha happy happy anniversary to uh, to this channel. I thought about talking about Holy Saturday again, but the video that I did last year, um, I mean, it really says most everything that I would want to say. Um, and also, I realized last year that I had completely shorted St. Guthlag. So, let me start by saying, this is going to be a very long video. Possibly longer than that last hour-long monstrosity that I did. And it's mostly going to be the reading of a poem. And um, if you are not uh, down for that, then, um, then, then you should run now. Okay, I've given you a chance to run. Um, so before I get started with this, uh, this does tie in with Holy Week, especially with the uh, um, Monday, Thursday, Good Friday, and and Holy Saturday, because you know what? I'm going to get to that in a moment. Let's start from the beginning. Um, I'm going to say ten years ago ish. Maybe not that many. Yeah, about 10 years ago, Father Sean uh, came to me and told me that he had had an icon commissioned of St. Guthlac, whom I had never heard of. And he wanted me to do a poem or a hymn for St. Guthlac. And because uh, um, I hadn't ever heard about him before, I had to do, you know, at least a little bit of research. Um, and I found this amazing story, like this really amazing story about this really amazing saint um, that had some really great source material. Now, at the same time, um, I, I had been reading about, um, th there were a couple of things going on at the same time. I'd, I'd been reading this book called uh, Badass of the Week. Um, and in it, there was a story about uh, Moses the Black. It's it's really a great story. But um, I had been thinking about him in comparison with like the way that like the first big saint that I'd been introduced to was Saint Francis, and he's kind of presented as a hippie and a nature lover, and and he's great. By the way, don't don't get me wrong, he's great. Um, but there was a difference between this story about St. Moses the Black that I had read and uh, the story about St. Francis. Then at the same time, I had seen for possibly the first time, I had seen Die Hard. Um, and I was thinking about Die Hard, like the Die Hard, the, the, um, the American heroes versus European, especially British heroes. So like on the one hand, I had my head, uh, John McClane from Die Hard and, um, Jack, uh, I can't remember his name. The guy from 24, um, these, you know, fly by the seat of your pants, follow your own loose cannon types. And then on the other hand, you had like the suave debonair, you know, for me, the epitome is on the one hand, John McClane walking out in bare feet that are all bloody and, and, you know, he's calling out his wife's name 
and and he just looks like completely beat down although he's got the gun taped to his back and then on the other hand you've got the suave smooth always got everything under control um 007 uh james bond or doctor who doctor who would be another good example of something that represents england and i love doctor who something that represents england as opposed to this american cowboy ideal i think that the bad guy and um Actually, even the bad guy, the bad guy in um, Die Hard is kind of like James Bond if he were a bad guy. And he makes fun of John McClane for being this uh, cowboy type, right? So I had that in my head, too. <clears throat> and then I'd been reading Anglo-Saxon stuff for a while, Beowulf and, and collecting words and stuff like that. So when I presented... One of the great things about Guthlack is that there's these, there's several versions of his life. There's, there's one that deals actually just with his death. There's one that deals with his struggle with the demons. And there's this Latin life that I haven't read. But the first two that I mentioned are in Old English and they are vital. And by vital, I mean they, they have that, um, earthy, gritty, goriness that you see like in the book of Judges. Uh, that you see in a lot of the Bible and that, that we kind of forget in our sanitized uh, readings of Scripture. Okay, so after reading all this stuff, oh, one last thing. This, for anybody who has read The Ballad of the White Horse, this owes a lot to that, especially the structure, but also the, the kind of the underpinning mentality of it. Um, so I had all that roiling around in my head and I, I read about the life of St. Guthlack and I was like, I'm, I'm going to have to do an epic poem. So I started, I had, I had good chunks of this done and then I was arrested and, uh, went to prison. Um, and there I was presented with I've said this before, the barbarian ethic, and I don't mean that in a bad way, is absolutely the, um, the set of rules that are followed in prison. Uh, you, Beowulf would fit in much, much better in a prison environment than he would in our modern day, um, environment. And I got so much uh, fodder to use in this poem from that. It's been kind of sitting around since then, and I'm, I've been trying to get it finished before his feast day. So this has a couple of new parts that I've added in the last week or two, um, in the hopes that I can have it done and presentable, uh, to give to Father Sean on, um, on April the 3rd. He's read most of it, uh, and actually he's been helping me out with these last parts. So, um, there was a dedication part at the beginning, which I've kind of set aside. So I'm going to start from the introduction. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to be basically reading the whole thing and commenting on where different parts come from. So pardon the stop and start. <clears throat> so let us now praise famous men, the fathers of our faith, the saints who from their labors rest now full of truth and grace. That comes from, I want to say Ecclesiasticus. Uh, chapter 41, I think. The Lord by them great glory wrought. Oh, one, la one other thing. There's a lot of alliteration in here because I was trying to keep that Anglo-Saxon thing going with the alliteration. The Lord by them great glory wrought by prophet, priest, and king. Through virgin pure and martyr meek. The poor in spirit, silent, weak. Through Roman, Hebrew, Celt, and Greek. And golden tongues that sing. Golden tongues referring to St. John Chrysostom. They filled the earth with holiness as bread is filled with leaven. As the word of God once with his birth and weakness laid aside his worth, thus dragging heaven down to earth and earth with him to heaven. I kind of like my work here, by the way. So if you see me rejoicing a little bit over what I've written, it's, it's that, that idea of God, of Jesus, dragging heaven down with him in, in the incarnation and then dragging our humanity back up with him 
our our flesh sitting in the Godhead on the throne. Uh, anyway, yet, oh, I'm going to change that. And there are those that we forget. I think it needs to be but. But there are those that we forget as though they'd never been. But God remembers each one still, and still they are our kin. O ubi sancti dei sunt, the blessed by God who bless, the soldiers of the risen sun who fought the fight of faith and won. Is there not left on earth just one? O sancti, ubi es? Um, o ubi sancti dei sunt means, O oh, where are the saints of God? And then, uh, O sancti ubi es means, O saint, where are you? The vulgar Cretans, that one, vulgar and Cretan, uh, well, vulgar just means common. And, uh, but, but it's come to mean something different. And Cretan actually is a word, a French word for Christian or a pronunciation of it. And it was used to refer to, um, mentally challenged people to remind the people who were saying it, like, instead of saying those whatevers are, there's Christians as in they are our brothers and sisters in Christ, a whole lot different than what, uh, uh, Luther, Luther called them changelings. Um, the vulgar Cretans, the ordinary Christians, the vulgar Cretans here, behold, their cloud surrounds us still. From prayers raised in Ninian's cave to Mary Hazel's holy grave and Brendan's mass at wail on wave, all following God's will. The holy ones and watchers come, that's a hymn by the way, the holy ones and watchers come as we on Christ are fed. I own as monks the dead paths race, while six winged seraphs hide their face, and singing sanctus join in praise when God becomes the bread. The throne of God descends to earth, the temple veil is furled, all heaven surrounds us as we sup, prostrate before the holy cup, with wine and blood and God filled up the center of the world. I love that idea that, that every time that we do the sacraments, every time that, that that the bread and wine become the body and the blood, that angels and saints surround us in wonder at, at what is happening there. We tend to think of it as common, but but it's 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 miraculous every single time, more than just miraculous. It it is in that moment as miraculous as as what happened on Christmas Day, as what happened on Easter. Now we get into the life of Guthlac. So I'm setting up the historical press, the uh, historical context here. Though for full 500 years, all Britain loved the Lord. Uh, the tradition is that Joseph of Arimathea um, brought Christianity to England. So we're saying, it, basically this is saying around 500 AD. Though for full five hundred years all Britain loved the Lord, invading Earl and thundering Thane ran roughshod o'er the ragged plain. The rubble of the Roman reign could not withstand the horde, so this is post fall of Rome. Alone and left without the will their weakened world toward, Britons broke, bereft of aid, fell prey to every foreign raid, the ankle of the English blade and steel of Saxon sword, the invasion of the Anglo Saxons. Between the eve of Arthur's dream and Alfred's English morn, in Mersh's marshy borderland, beneath the sign, the blood-red hand, good Gathlac there was born. So after Camelot, the, the, the Arthurian stories are thought to have taken place um, long before the Anglo-Saxons came. So what was left over of Rome combined with that Celtic, uh, Roman plus Celtic, basically, culture, and then the later Anglo-Saxon uh, um, nation that was created by um, Alfred the Great. This is where Guthlac was born. At 15, he took up the sword and fought for Ethelred. He took to heart the blood-red hand, and with his faithful warrior band, became a bane upon the land, and filled his foes with dread. So this is one of the new parts that I'm trying to add as a transition Another king, another king, God, 
an envoy sent to Guthlac, man of woe, to bring Guthlac into his core to fight a different, deeper war against an older foe. foe. The lonely wanderer, this is the envoy, the lonely wanderer blocked the path of Guthlac in the road. Guthlac says, this toll, the toll for this our road you'll pay, yet with your life you'll leave this day, though we will send you on your way, relieved, relieve it of your load, any wealth that he might have. St. Nathan, now, in the story, St. Nathan uh, comes to Guthlac several times during the course of his life, so this is the envoy. St. Nathan stood before the man and all his warrior band, he softly spoke young Guthlac's name as God's light wreathed his head like flame. His flesh flayed from his fragile flame. His flesh flayed from his fragile frame he held in his right hand. In the pictures of, uh, he, he was uh, martyred by having his skin cut off. And so in a lot of the pictures of his martyrdom, he's holding his flesh. This is St. Nathan talking. A friend to pain, you fight and train and march on end for days. Can you, well, I'm sorry, I skipped ahead too far. This is another new part. A greater king than Ethelred, your service has laid claim. Leave off this petty war for pelf. A new one fight, a new one wage to save yourself, to gather everlasting wealth, a new and secret name. Pelf means like stolen booty. A friend to pain, you fight and train and march on end for days. Can you endure what I endured while singing songs of psalms of praise? This is said by the man who's holding his flesh that was cut from his body in his hand. In rage and ruin, wreck and war, your sword swings from on high. You know you're strong enough to kill, but have you strength to die? If you so ordered, all your men would charge the halls of hell. Your fellows follow your command. Can you command yourself? You're brave enough to bear the brand, to terrorize the weak. Do you have courage great enough to bow, becoming weak? His dare delivered to the youth, St. Nathan took his leave. As Guthlac pondered on his word, the meaning of the message heard, his stifled spirit in him stirred, and he chose to believe. So this next part is Guthlac. This next part, by the way, does not appear in any of the poems. He just goes to a monk's, uh, an abbey, Repton House, um, to, to become a monk. So a lot of this stuff is somewhat modern insertions, but you know, my poem, right? <clears throat> so Guthlac went to Repton House as monk to learn God's grace. He went to work. He went to pray. He went to sing the Psalms all day. His earthly wars he put away to see the Lord's fair face. Three visitors to Gethlac came to chase him and to guide. The abbess spoke of things we see, the angel of the Trinity, the saint a wit more wise than he to quell his witless pride. So Gethlac is trying to understand God and the three people talk to him. The abbess who heads the house, this, that's the first one. The second one is an angel. Uh, and the third one is St. Nathan again. The God who made outlandish beasts of sea and air and land, Leviathan and Narwhal too, the ostrich, snail, and kangaroo, and this God, Guthlac, you think you could ever understand? Wheels and wheels and still one wheel whom heaven and earth have trod, Father, Son, and Spirit, He as infinite as unity, the three in one and one in three and fully flesh in God. Our wise men he rejects as fools, our fools he claims as his. How shall this God in words be caught, whose thought is higher than our thought? I'd rather say what he is not instead of what he is. He listened to each speaker's words, and thus when they were through, could Guthlac finally understand, could Guthlac finally knew. This next line that I'm about to say, definitely a modern thing. This is not something that somebody would have said back then, but I, I love this idea of us and our, I saw this video once, you know what, the video doesn't matter. We're meat. We're made of meat. And our brains are made of meat with electricity in it. And, and, and we talk as if we could understand God. My meat mind can't conceive a God who nursed from virgin breast, who knelt to wash his students' feet, who blessed the poor and cursed a tree, forgave the whores and damned the priests and trampled death by death, 
For Christ is King, he reigns in ways we cannot comprehend. He makes a throne of maiden womb, a manger, cross, and stone-sealed tomb, and bringing light to Sheol's gloom, he reigns and brings death ends. Death's end. For many years, this is where Guthlack gets his commission, what it is that God chose him for. For many years, by sweat and tears, he struggled with his sin. Yet when it seemed the worst was past, and when he thought his when and thought he had his sins nailed fast, when he had found some peace at last, Saint Nathan came again. Your captain calls you to the fray, rise up and be not slow, as you once fought for Ethelred, and struggled with your soul once dead, to fall in Crowland you are led, to battle Guthlet, go. I spelled it, by the way, like cro like a land of crows. That's not what it means, and that's not even how it's spelled. But I I like that idea. Like you know, crows are the dead, and kind of like a cursed place. Secure and sane, the savage waste, and to your care tis given. For though the earth is sick with sin, it is the Lord's and all therein. That's a psalm. And as as it was once, make once again a colony of heaven. The just that idea of saining, of, of baptizing something and, and giving it back to God, who made it in the first place. Recall what, recall what Christ once did for you, to heal you, hale and whole. So take this berg by rack can wrecked. This comes from the Old English, by the way. Recall what Christ once did for you, to heal you, hale and whole. So take this berg by rack can wrecked by wrathful, writhing, wild wraith trekked. And as your soul by sin stained specked was saved, so save this soil. As the word once wore this world to harrow and to heal, that man, that fallen half-formed fake, by grace his nature might partake, rebuild, rebuild this burg, reform, remake, revive, and make it real. So Gethlight goes to get his fellow monks. So Guthlack called his brother monks, his new-found holy corps. With me, my men, our captain calls to leave these peaceful hallowed halls for Crowland's withered, wasted walls were riding out to war. And Guthlack chose to make their home. But Guthlack chooses a barrow to... That's, that's, what he, they, they, that's what they initially live in. This is a back and forth between Guthlack and the monks who don't understand why he's doing what he's doing. So Guthlack chose to make their house an empty catacomb. We know the holy goal you crave, these phantom fens to sane and save, but why this plundered pagan grave should be our humble home. For Christ, a barrow plunderer and grave robber is Lord. He snatches us from death's decay and steals our treasured sin away. He'll carry off our souls one day, his hallowed heavenly hoard. This brackish water must we drink and eat this bread stone tough? His broken body is your meat, his blood poured out for you to drink, a meal we hardly dare to eat. And is this not enough? The prince of power also is the firstborn slave of sin. Recall how Christ, the king on high, once laid his crown and glory by, how he destroyed death when he died. With weakness we will win. So now... This, this part does come from one of the Old English versions of the poem. And a lot of what you hear in here is like, it, I, like I kind of just stole it directly from the Old English uh, uh, original. The hour of horrid haunts had come, a shadow going gang. Thus sighed the sorrow born of sin, and heaving harm songs hurled at him, malicious and man-harming hymns, and bleak, ba bleak blame-babbling rang. The demons who called Crowland home since times of ancient Cain, the prayers of Guthlack fueled their fears, the psalms he sang all hurt their ears, and so they, and they had suffered this for years of hellish rage and pain. They'd roamed the world since once they were by God cast from above, and sought the shadow places for a respite from his love. And so the hellborn thus conspired Guthlack to drive away, to break his bones, to crush, to kill, to break his faith, his hope, his will, to send him far from Crowland's hill before the Paschal Day. 
So now you're going to hear the back and forth between the demons and Guthlag. In this version of the poem, and it is possible that it is... Okay, if I did my math correctly, Guthlag um, died very near to Easter. And I know that he died pretty soon after the events of where he had um, been had the contest with the demons. So um, what I've done is I've made it so that the three temptations that he's facing happen on Monday, Thursday, Good Friday, and then Holy Saturday. And then it rolls into Easter uh, Sunday, Pascha. So here we are on Holy Thursday with the first temptation. Unless you leave your dead liege, Lord, the beast to Gethlech said, I'll beat you as your Lord was beat. I'll pierce your side, your hands, your feet. I'll tear your flesh to shreds of meat. This bog will flow blood red. You have a lot to say, my, this is Guthlack. You have a lot to say, my friend. I've yet to feel a blow. It seems that all you have to sell are tickets with no show. Okay, so this is a direct prison reference. Um, one of the phrases that we had, well, that I was taught, I mean, I've never actually said this to anybody, but was uh, wolf tickets. Wolf tickets is when somebody's saying, you know, that they're making a bunch of boasts or they say that they're going to take somebody on or something. Uh, and then the other ones say, oh, you ain't got nothing but tickets. Um, meaning, you know, he's saying a bunch, but there's nothing to back them up. Um, wolf tickets. Use it. It should be a thing. The demons laughed uncertainly at Guthlack, man of woes. A brittle bone bag bent and thin, a rack of ribs, a skein of skin, still flashing a defiant grin against his hellborn foes. The battle joy, Guthlack means battle joy. The battle joy gripped Guthlack then, remembering old wars. And although fresh from Monday Mass, Monday Thursday, and although fresh from Monday Mass, said, let's go if you've got the brass. Laid up down here upon my ass, by God, I'll still kick yours. <laughs> That comes from, like, almost directly from the Old English. The Old English said, in the Old English, he says, alone, I can oppress you all upon my romp. That had to make it in. Um, it, that right there was more than anything else what inspired me to, that I, that I had to make this a whole thing. I'm going to read that one again. It might be my favorite stanza in the whole thing. The battle joy gripped Guthlack then, remembering old wars. And although fresh from Maundy Mass, said, let's go if you've got the brass. Laid up down here upon my ass, by God, I'll still kick yours. I'm through with all your threats of harm, foul creature of the curse. You think that you were so damn tough? My grandma treated me more rough. Let's go then if you're hard enough. I beat myself up worse. The demon screaming grabbed the man by insults thus enraged. And though the baleful blows increased, fast falling from the pride-born beast, still Guthlack never stalled nor ceased from singing songs of praise. That was one of the challenges that Nathan gave him. The hellion, having done his worth at worst, then flung him in his den, yet torn and trembling, rent and red, and raising battered bloody head, good Guthlack, bruised and bloody, said, That's fun. Let's go again. <laughs> You know what? If no one ever read this poem again, I would not regret writing this at all. This is, this is, uh, I love this guy. So now we're on Good Friday. Good Friday, they took to, they took to the skies and bade him look below. See parents who their sons abhor and plundering, raping men of war, vile actions which you should deplore. And Guthlack answered, so? They are baptized. The chrism cross, they're on their heads anoint. Yet view them, prideful, angry, vain, vengeful, vicious, kin of Cain. Guthlack said, wait now. Once again, I'm lost, guys. What's your point? Your Christian kin are steeped in sin, in loathsome lust and lies. They break their vows to steal a kiss. Forbidden fruit and wanton bliss. I'm sorry, boys. Did you think this was Eden, paradise? The church is not a hall of saints, all pure and bright and fair. We come here bent and broken men, diseased by death and stained by sin. The church is where the cure begins. This is intensive care. That's actually a line. 
I wanted to take it out, but it said exactly what I wanted it to say at the same time. Like intensive care is so modern that it just seemed to jar the rest of it. And I gave it to Father Sean to let him make the decision, and he wanted it in. Um, the church is a hospital. It is not a museum. We're not there to be on display. We're not there because we're perfect. We're there to be made perfect because we are messed up. This part, by the way, is for me as much as anybody. Me more than anybody. Especially these next parts. Your words are wise and woven lies from bent tales told in part. For faithless Peter keeps the keys. There's Paul, the saint of sinners chief, and David, killer, cheat, and thief, was after God's own heart. The worker will complete his work, so with one voice we say, both warrior kin and monk in cave, and castled king and man enslaved, from baptized babe to saints in grave, we have been saved, are being saved, and will be saved one day. Now we're on Holy Saturday. By the way, part of the reason for all the candles is because that's what I was doing at this time last year. Um, rebuffed again, those sons of sin then waxed both fay, fay and fell. On Saturday, filled full of hate, their souls ablaze with fire irate, they drop below to Sheol's gate and to the mouth of hell. Your God gave you into our hands to do with as we dare. And so we will to send you whole, your body, mind, and cursed soul, into this helpless, hopeless, hellish hole, to stay forever there. Guthlack responds, If you are servants of my king, then fling me to the flame. Though he destroy me, yet will I still bless his holy name. That comes from Job. This flaming... Okay, so this next part is based on the the idea that I read in an Orthodox essay once that um, it is all the love of God and whether that love of God is experienced as hell or heaven is on us. This flaming flood flows from his throne as fire and water wed. This stream that stings and salves I'll swim in justice sweet and grace most grand, I'd rather be consumed by him than by your hands be fed. One of my favorite parts of any book ever is in The Horse and His Boy when Huen sees Aslan for the first time and she comes out to see him first before anybody else. And she says, please, sir, I'd rather be eaten by you than fed by anybody else. Although a slug, I hunger for the salt of his embrace. My death is sweet if burned before the fire of his face. That comes from this Ukrainian song that I cannot find, but that idea that God is salt and I am a slug. And I slither my way into his arms anyway because I desire his presence that much. You seek to thwart your maker, yet you serve to work his will. All things work for his glory, so you are his servant still. No torments touch my body by your master, nor by you, your error born of pride-bent will, which older than the oldest hill has missed that which is older still, yet still is stayed and true. Let God arise and scattered wide may all his enemies be, and let all those who hate his face before his presence flee. I want to say that that Psalm 69 is called the Exalted, and it's the beginning of all of the Easter liturgy, which brings us into Easter Sunday. Just as the words had left his lips, the sun began to rise. The paschal dawn began to crest and start its joyful journey rest of every Christian day most blessed, adorned by purple skies. St. Nathan then appeared again. Your work is almost done. By faith, you've crushed the dark of doubt. With godly hope, despair cast out. In love, put hellish hate to rout. Now put them on the run. Then Nathan passed to Guthlag's hand the scouring scourge of God, 
and with St. Nathan's gift endowed, good Guthlac, grinning, laughed out loud, and turned to face the hell-worn cloud, cr crowd. The battle then was on. That is the icon that Father Sean had made with um, Nathan holding, the, I mean, uh, Guthlac holding the scourge that, um, that Nathan had given him, getting ready to beat on some demons. His brethren baffled, oh, okay, so in this next part, what I'm imagining is only Guthlac can see the demons. And so he's fighting all of these people, uh, that all these enemies that his fellow monks can't see, and they just think that he looks insane. His brethren, baffled, could not find the foe at which he flailed. His scouring scourge fell from on high, and Kyrie his battle cry, the demons he assailed. A mad berserker's crazed attack is feral, fierce, and wild. Yet holy joy was on his face. The running, leaping saint gave chase, a strange ballet, a frenzied race, as giddy as a child. Like Jesus in the temple court, with tables tipped and thrown, and as once happened long, long ago, with trumpet blast and ram horn blow, like Joshua at Jericho, the walls came tumbling down. The demons are chased away. Um, so this last part is based on the poem about the death of Guthlac. And so much of this, more than anything else, is taken almost directly word for word from the Old English poems. With Crowland thus secured for God, Guthlac began to wane. Come wrap me in an earthly womb, this soul house, faded, fleshly home, these limbs inside a shroud of loam, and into earthly pain. I do not fear the end of life, nor ceasing of my breath, the fumbling of this shadow life, the tumbling of this body strife, the crashing, crumbling of the light, nor coming of my death. The mortal making morsel then on Guthlac took its toll, that miserable drink, the death-deep cup, the enemy brewed and then served up, to Eve and Adam who did sup, and Guthlac now as well. Yet through the veil good Guthlac saw a high and heavenly hall. He also saw within his cell a mead hall ringed with warriors fell, a wedding feast, a lake of ale, and Christ the king of all. That's one of the prayers of um, Briad of, of Kildare, Kildare, I think so, uh, is that she prays for a lake of ale for all of the people of God to be gathered around. Um, and that's one of the reasons that, uh, that I like Celtic Christianity because we get, we get beer lakes. And so good Guthlac left this life, no more this world to roam a faded fairer on his way into his holy home. So heed the words, the life of Christ, and ask not how or why. Death conquers when you try to win, but loses when you die. Part of what makes Holy Week so powerful is that we get to walk that path with Jesus. We get to we get to be mocked. We get we get the privilege of being persecuted if we're lucky. We get we get to um, be weak, and we get to see God's victory. Remember that it was not on Easter Sunday that Jesus won. I was talking about this last year. It was when he died, when he willingly gave up his life on the cross. I don't mean that he willingly allowed himself to be led to the cross. I mean that on the cross, he let his life go. It was in that moment that the graves were opened. He'd already won. Um, the disciples just didn't know it yet. It is, it is in our weakness. It is in our death 
that through God we become victorious. And that's what uh, Guthlack was able to do. It's like his, after he met Nathan the first time, that his life was a, it was a, it was a continual giving up, giving up, giving up, continuing kenosis until he was weak enough to win the battle for Crowland. Um, and so I, I, I can think of few saints better suited to be talked about during Holy Week, especially because his feast day is on April the 3rd. So thank you, God, for your for your gift for life. St. Guthlack, pray for us. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, I give you my heart, my soul, and my strength. Make me a good man.